occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Max Worley III. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, patriots and preppers. I am Mac Worley III, and this is On the Move, the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. As I say every episode, this is not my show. This is your show. This is your grassroots activism movement. It's the On the Move movement. It cannot function without you. However, it's bigger than one man. I want to thank each and every one of you for your patriotism and for taking the time to get involved. Today is going to be a really good show. It's uh, March tw- or March 2nd, 2014, and we got a good one in store for you today. Uh, with that said, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different topics, uh, such as the escalating situation in the Ukraine. We're going to talk about crazy Joe Biden and the, pro- uh, the other progressive ideologues. So we're also going to be talking about whatever else uh, comes up. Anything that you guys would like to talk about, feel free to call in with topics of your own. Uh, We'll be taking listener calls and reading your emails. Uh, If you'd like to join the conversation today, please give us a call at 619-924-0986, or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com, here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash onthemoveshow, facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow, youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow, and twitter.com forward slash onthemoveshow. You can also check out our stores at onthemoveshow.com by clicking the shop link on the home page. <clears throat> excuse me, on the home page. We have hundreds of products for sale on there, and it ranges from T-shirts to freeze-dried food to books that I'd recommend reading uh, to bumper stickers and so much more. Your purchases will help make On the Move bigger and better. We really appreciate your support. So, you know, I, I bring up the show all the time, or I'm sorry, the store all the time, and, you know, I, one thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, we got a lot of good stuff on there, and it's it's made from us. A lot of it, it you know, is, is stuff that I particularly wanted to design uh, or my, my wife came up with, but it's all stuff that we thought would be cool, and we wanted ourselves. So, uh, you know, it's for Patriots, by Patriots. It's, it's stuff like that that, uh, you know, we wanted to actually, uh, you know, make and have. So, I'm sure if you guys check it out, if you go to onthemoveshow.com right now and you click the shop link, we got a few other stores in there. Uh, we got the merchandise store, which has basically like shirts and stuff like that. We got the Amazon affiliate. Um, that has like Amazon wish list things that, uh, that I've purchased in the past or I want to get. I've done some research on. Some of them I've reviewed. And, uh, you know, it's all stuff that I'd recommend getting. So, uh, And the other, the other store on there is the uh, freeze-dry guy store. And that has a bunch of like freeze-dried food and stuff like that, a lot of prepping gear things of that nature. So uh, feel free to check it out. I'm sure the stuff uh, on there is something that you'd be interested in. Uh, I guarantee there's going to be something on there for everybody. So, all right. uh, I just want to give you guys a heads up. We have a new quick poll at the bottom of the main page on on onthemoveshow.com for you all to vote on. It asks, is it time for a new political party? Yes, no, unsure. I'm looking forward to seeing the results of this quick poll. Don't forget, you can also leave comments in the results uh, section uh, of the quick poll at onthemoveshow.com. If you have something you'd like to say, leave a comment, and we'll read it on the air on the next episode. So with that said, give us a call and let us know uh, what's on your mind. The number to the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. So it's time for the next segment of the show, and we're calling it This Day in History. This day in history. Because people have got to know whether or not presidents are crook. Well, I'm not crook. Yes, today. What our country can do for you. Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev. A date which will live in infamy. We shall fight in the field and in the street. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. All right, according to Yahoo News, on March 2nd, 1943, that's 71 years ago, wartime rationing of processed foods under a point system began in the U.S. With the onset of World War II, numerous challenges confronted the American people. The government found it necessary to ration food, gas, and even clothing during that time. Americans were asked to conserve everything. With not one and not a single person unaffected by the war, rationing meant sacrifices for everyone. In spring of 1942, the rationing program was set in motion. Rationing would deeply affect the American way of life for most people. 
The federal government needed to control the supply and demand rationing was introduced to avoid public anger with shortages and to not allow only the wealthy to purchase commodities. While industry and commerce were affected, individuals felt effects more intensely. People were often required to give up many uh, materials, uh, many material goods, but there was also an increased employment. Individual efforts evolved into clubs and organizations coming to terms with the immediate circumstances. Joining together to support and maintain supply levels for troops abroad meant making daily adjustments. Their efforts also included scrap drives, taking factory jobs, goods donations, and other similar projects to assist on the front. Government sponsored sponsored ads, uh, radio shows, posters, and pamphlet campaigns urging American people to comply. With a sense of urgency, the campaign appealed to America to contribute by whatever means they had without complaint. The propaganda was highly effective in reaching the masses. Rationing regulated the amount of commodities that consumers could obtain. Sugar rationing cards took effect in 1943 with the distribution of sugar buying cards. Uh, Registration usually took place in local schools. Each family was asked to only send one member for registration and be prepared to describe all other members of the family. Coupons were distributed based on family size and the coupon book allowed the holder to buy a a specified amount Possession of a coupon book did not guarantee that sugar would actually be available, though. Americans learned to utilize what they had during rationing time. While some foods were scarce, others did not require rationing, and Americans adjusted accordingly. Red stamp rationing covered all meats, butters, fats, and oils, and with some exceptions, cheese. Uh, Each person was allowed a certain amount of points weekly with expiration dates to consider. Blue stamp rationing covered canned, bottled, frozen fruits and vegetables, plus juice and dry beans and such processed foods as soups, baby food, and ketchup. Rationing stamps became like a a kind of currency for each family uh, being used in a uh, war rationing book. Each stamp authorized a purchase of rationed goods in in a quantity and time designated, and the book guaranteed each family its fair share of goods made scarce thanks to the war. Rationing was also determined by a point system. Uh, Like I said, today is the the date of them implementing that point system. So some grew weary of trying to figure out uh, what coupon went with which item and how many points they needed to purchase them with, while some coupons did not require points at all, in addition to food rationing encompassing uh, clothing, shoes, uh, coffee, gasoline tires, and uh, fuel oil. So they were rationing all these things. Uh, With each coupon book came uh, Um, Excuse me, I can't speak. Specific uh, deadlines, basically, specifications and deadlines. So uh, rationing locations were in public view. Rationing of gas and tires strongly depended on the distance to one's job. If one was fortunate enough to own an automobile and drive then specified at 35 miles per hour, one might have a small amount of gas remaining at the end of the day uh, to visit nearby relatives. So it's pretty interesting how, how they actually rationed everything. You know, and for the most part, uh, this rationing actually did uh, increase black market uh, dealings in clothing and liquor and meat and sugar and gasoline in, in the United States. And this is, you know, this is one thing I say all the time is in regards to prohibition or any kind of government restriction. What it does is it does create a black market, an underground, unregulated, untaxed black market. So this is one of the consequences we've seen. And we see this throughout history, in not just American history, but world history. Any time the, the government gets involved and they start restricting things, they start limiting things, prohibiting things, um, rationing, any time we see this kind of stuff, the black market starts to boom. And you create a situation where it's actually uh, now a criminal entity and it's, you know, it's surrounded by other, all sorts of other crimes. So you know, we, just, we see what happened during Prohibition in uh, the 1920s of alcohol, and you know, that, that actually helped prop up the, these uh, big uh, corrupt organizations – and, you know, the, the organizations were, were really uh, a threat to the U.S. government, which is one reason why we have alcohol now. We're allowed to have alcohol because they realized that they were hurting themselves. They were, they were actually propping up these, uh, these mafia organizations. So, anyway, uh, can you imagine if the government actually did this now? Uh, have you guys heard of uh, Victory Gardens? 
Uh, back in the day, uh, Americans were asked by the president to plan vic- uh, to actually plant victory gardens to conserve food during this ration. So, for a small investment of soil, seed, and time, families could enjoy fresh vegetables for months. By 1945, an estimated 20 million victory gardens produced approximately 40 percent of America's vegetables. So, just imagine if President Obama said, "Hey, I need you guys to grow victory garden to ease the demand at the grocery stores." Can, can you imagine what Americans would do now? First of all, a lot of people live in apartments and they don't have the ability to actually grow a victory garden. But even the ones that could, do you really think that they would actually bother doing that? This is why I say that the, the World War II generation, uh, that is the greatest generation that's ever lived. You know, th- Those are the people that would actually do what was best for their country. They weren't selfish. You know, If, if we looked at our country now and compared, it, compared us now to then, Man, we've become a society that's so selfish and self-centered. We don't even, you know, we, there's no way that we would do that kind of thing. Uh, you know, at least not a lot of us. There's no way that 20 million victory gardens would, would be in America if we did it now. No way. Absolutely no way. So with, with all the craziness going on in the world right now, in, in my opinion, I don't think it's a bad idea to start stocking up on food. You know, and I, I said it before, but we have problems like inflation from QE where – you know, it could cause the U.S. dollar to collapse, and not even that. But let's say that the, the U.S. dollar doesn't collapse. But what if you know the world just dis- decides to stop using the U.S. dollar to buy oil, and and that would basically stop us from being the world currency. So if that happened, that would drastically hurt our country. You know, not to mention the fact that war seems like it's looming on the horizon right now. We have Iran who wants to park their ships offshore. And, and they're talking about trying to basically show that they're not afraid of us and, and that they're going to show, make a show of force by bringing their, their warships right, in, right at the border of American waters and international waters. They want to basically just you know, put it out that they're not afraid of us and they don't care about us anymore. So, so this right here, is, you know, that's scary enough. But we have Russia conducting missile tests where now I believe that Russia is, is testing out right now a uh, EMP. They keep sending a missile into the air and explodes at the same height, you know, at, at the same time. And, and people are thinking it's a it's a failure. But then when asked about it, uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, says, "Who says it's failing?" So that leads me to believe that they're they're testing out some kind of EMP weapon. So Russia also brought battleships off the coast of Cuba. They didn't tell us; they just surprised us. Ta-da! Hey, there's battleships next to Cuba. So that's kind of scary. Also, you know, Russia is trying to get more bases in South America. They want to get a base in Cuba and other places. So Russia is trying to expand and get bigger. And, and basically, it seems like to me that they're trying to reestablish the Soviet Union. They seem to think that we're still in the Cold War. So, uh, you know, Russia is also invading Ukraine. I'm sure you guys have heard that in the news. That right there is crazy, and we'll talk about that some more later. You know, China is rapidly expanding their navy. They're turning their water into a blue, or I'm sorry, they're turning their navy into a blue water navy, which means that they're actually out there in the oceans now. They've typically they've been they've had a navy force that was that was stronger on the rivers, but now they're trying to actually get their navy out into the oceans and be strong. You know, we got South uh, South Korea that's now accusing North Korea of sending missiles into their waters in their territory. So, you know, it seems like. There's a lot of stuff out there that's going on. There's, there's tons of things happening in the world right now. Could we be on the brink of war? I, I don't know. I mean, it, who really knows? Uh, not to mention everything going on with the economy. we got Obamacare. It's causing people to lose their job and, and get their hours cut. You know, it, and not to mention Obamacare is actually making people not have health care because they lose their job, which is what was providing them their health insurance in the first place. So – you know, now you could have increased med- medical bills because you don't have health insurance anymore. What if you get hurt? You know, what what if you get sick? Uh, you'll have increased health insurance costs if you if you decide to stay with Obamacare because your health insurance premiums now are doubled and tripled. You know, you're, you're subsidizing other people. Might I suggest that you guys look into buying food? And the reason why I say that is because food has historically always been worth something during times of emergency. And the value will always go up with inflation. Here's what I would I, I would do if I if I were you, and this is what I'm trying to do myself. I'm trying to stockpile a little bit of food, just enough to get me through, you know. But but if you guys considered 
you know, go into onthemoveshow.com, click the shop link, go to the freeze dry guy, check out their mountain house, uh, their house, mountain house food. They have a lot of really good stuff. Mountain house food is really tasty, by the way. Um, you know, I've had it. I really enjoy it. And it, it lasts uh, between 10 and 25 years, depending on what kind you get. But there's a lot of stuff on there that will last for, for decades. So it's, it's really interesting. It's really something cool to, to think about. And, you know, it, it will actually save you money. If you buy it now rather than later, you know, it, it'd be something, it, it's something that may benefit you. So, and, and it, it's, it may save you some money. So, all right, uh, here's what I would like to do. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back in a few seconds, and we're going to start the Weekly Defender. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us. Okay, now it's time for my favorite part of the show, and we like to call it the Weekly Defender. And now it's time for the Weekly Defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family, and the right to defend All right, this is a segment of the show where I like to report on armed citizens in the news who have used their firearms to defend their family, their property, and themselves. Our first weekly defender we found on the Dallas News. Uh, two men arranged to meet one another about a Craigslist, ad, a Craigslist ad for a motorcycle. When they met, the man who posted the ad pulled out a gun and pointed it at the buyer who was with his daughter and father. The buyer pulled out his own pistol and fired at the armed suspect, causing him to flee. The family called police and reported the incident. Officers located the suspect, and he was treated for his gunshot wounds. Investigators reportedly found <clears throat> ski masks and batons in the suspect's car. He had previously been convicted of various crimes, including arson, theft, and aggravated robbery. So that's pretty crazy. You know, that we hear about that kind of stuff all the time. You know, a lot of people say it's you know, really dangerous to, to meet somebody off the Internet, and that's obviously true. Uh, this is actually one thing I've heard in the past of uh, basically uh, criminals targeting people from Craigslist. So it's really interesting uh, and, and good for this guy. He protected his family, and, uh, you know, that's really awesome. So our next weekly defender we found uh, on the Herald Dispatch, when an altercation between a man and a woman escalated at Shoop's Bar, the man was escorted out. <coughs> Excuse me. As the troublemaker was being escorted out of the building by the bar's bouncer, he turned and drew a pistol. <coughs> Man, <clears throat> sorry about that. All right. Uh, he began to uh, fire. Uh, I'm sorry. He began firing inside the main area of the bar, striking the woman, as well as two others. Aaron Shoulders, 25, the bar's bouncer, acted quickly, drawing his own gun and returning fire, killing the shooter. It was reported that the three in injured individuals did not sustain life-threatening wounds and are expected to recover. So I love hearing about how law-abiding citizens use firearms to protect themselves. You have a right to defend your life. You have a right to defend your family. And you have a right to defend your freedom. We at On The Move, we support your rights. And if you have a story about how you lawfully defended yourself or you'd like to comment on one of these stories, we'd like to hear from you. Give us a call. The number to the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that's 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. And since we're talking about the right of self-defense, 
Uh, here's an artic- uh, article from the Associated Press about Chinese stabbings that we found on MyWay.com. <clears throat> Authorities on Sunday blamed a slashing rampage that killed 29 people and wounded 143 at a train station in southern China on separatists from the country's far west, while local residents said the government crackdowns had taken a toll on the alleged culprits. Police fatally shot four of the assailants, putting the overall death toll to 33, and captured another after the attack late Saturday in Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province, of the Yunnan province. Uh, officials, uh, the official of Xinhua News Agency said, uh, but authorities were searching for at least five more of the black clad uh, attackers. So, you know, my thoughts on this, all right? China is a, is a, a country that has basically no uh, firearms with their public. They, they should be this uh, utopia, according to the, the socialist uh, mindset, you know, as, as far as these progressives. They, they, they want nothing more to, to disarm the people. So with that said, you know, China should be relatively safe, right? No one can get a gun but the police officers. So China should be the safest place out there because no one has the right to defend themselves with with a firearm. No, that's not really the case. And this proves that gun control is is not the answer. Okay, and and this is this is everything right here. Okay, people can stop, uh, you know, a group of people that that are going around stabbing people if they have a gun. The police showed up and they shot four of the assailants. That right there, the gun. They actually prevented the the crime. And how in the world can 29 people be killed and 143 people wounded from knives? This couldn't happen in America. Ask yourself, what would happen if this – even if a group of 20 people came in with knives in in, in some random place in America, somebody's going to have a gun on them. And and that is why the gun is the great equalizer – the gun can, can actually prevent and discourage people from, uh, from attacking. So even if one guy is trying to defend himself, even if it's from 20 guys with guns, criminals want a soft target. Criminals aren't looking for a fair fight. They're not trying to, to go out and get a real challenge. If one guy with a gun is shooting back, even if the criminals have guns, they are discouraged from going that way. They don't, they don't care about that guy. They want the easy kill. So that's why this could never happen in America. That's why the, the situation that happened in uh, – oh, shoot, I can't remember what African country that was. Um, but there was a terrorist that had basically taken over a mall somewhere in Africa, I believe, and they, they had taken it over for, for a long time. It was several days, if not weeks. But um, anyway, uh, this kind of stuff could not happen in America, and it's because Americans have guns. Americans will use their guns to defend themselves. So, uh, also, I just want to point out, uh, we got a a message in the chat room here. Uh, China also has ships off the coast of California right now, and they're saying that they're fishing vessels. So, you know, this all goes to what I'm saying. You know, everything seems like it's working against us. It seems like the the more that goes on, uh, you know, we're seeing that all these countries are basically probing us and and trying to see if we have any weakness. So, It just kind of goes in, in, into what I was saying about, uh, you know, it's, it's important to be prepared. It's important to really think about, uh, you know, your, your preparations that you have. Do you have enough food to get by if the grocery store closed? You know, do you have uh, enough guns and ammo to get by if, you know, everything is shut down? And, you know, what would happen if this country was at war? You know, it, I'm sure a lot of you probably like me have, have thought about the, you know, the, the what would happen in a Red Dawn scenario and, you know, I, I think, honestly, we are closer than we have been in a long time to a Red Dawn scenario. Uh, this, to me, feels like a second Cold War. And, I, you know, I'm not really sure where things are going to go. But anyway, uh, at this point, we're going to start the, uh, the next segment of the show. We like to call it the Mac Attack. segment of the show where I give you my take on outrageous events in the news. If you'd like to join the conversation, please give us a call 
at 619-924-0986. Again, that is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. All right, so, uh, you know, the situation in Kiev and the Ukraine, it's escalating, and we're seeing this uh, it's getting more escalated every day. According to the Wall Street Journal, on Friday, armed men surrounded Crimea's two main airports. Uh, they took command of its state television network and set up checkpoints along the key roads connecting the peninsula to the rest of Ukraine. On Saturday, professional military men in unmarked green camouflage uniforms appeared outside the Crimean Parliament building in Sifmeropol. Uh, Ukrainian officials said the well-equipped men, who uh, many carried sophisticated automatic weapons, were Russian soldiers. The leader of the Crimea Tartars, the ethnic minority that accounts for about 12% of Crimea and supports a new government in Kiev, sought to dispel the notion that the seizure of government buildings in Crimea had grown out of a citizen's uprising. These buildings were seized by uh, specially trained people acting on military orders, said Refat Chabarov, the Tartar leader and deputy in the parliament at a news conference on Saturday. Ukrainian um, military bases were quickly surrounded and sealed off Saturday by Russian forces in Crimea as the Kremlin made preparations for a large-scale landing of troops. Russian troops were posted near uh, gates, near the gates and around the perimeter of several bases in Sevastopol. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, when asked why they were there, officers replied that they were providing security to the bases to stop for any pro-Russian citizens who might try to take them. The troops posted around the base had markings, I'm sorry, had no markings on their uniform. Their commander, when asked if he could reveal the, uh, the nationality of them, said, of course not. Others actually admitted that they were Russian. So uh, Ukrainian officials at base said that Russians were, following, or were allowing food and provisions to be brought in. So well, one thing that I, I, I was curious about, because uh, I've always heard about the, the Budapest Memorandum, and I couldn't, I didn't really know what it was, and I actually looked into it. So uh, one question I asked was, doesn't the Budapest Mem- Memorandum actually prevent Russia from invading the Ukraine? And I found an article that explains what the Budapest Memorandum it actually is. According to an article in Radio Free Europe, the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurance is a diplomatic memorandum that was signed in December 1994 by Ukraine, Russia, the United States, and the United Kingdom. It is not a formal treaty, but rather a diplomatic document under which signatories made promises to each other as part of the denuclearization of the former Soviet republics after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Under the memorandum, Ukraine promised to remove all Soviet era nuclear weapons from its territory, send them to disarmament facilities in Russia, and sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Ukraine kept these promises. In Russia and the Western signatory countries, essentially uh, consecrated the uh, sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine as an independent state. They did so by applying the principles of territorial integrity and non-intervention in the 1975 Helsinki Final Act, a Cold War era treaty signed by 35 states, including the Soviet Union, to an independent post-Soviet Ukraine. So with that said, what does this actually mean to us? You know, I I don't really have answers here. I don't have any answers. All I actually have is questions. Uh, You know, I'm not really sure what's going on here or how our president will respond. You know, I'm very concerned about how it seems like the rest of the world perceives America as weak. It's apparent that they – it's apparent that they feel this way from their actions. You know, they no longer think we're a relevant threat and that they can do basically whatever they want and there will be little to no consequences. I'm not sure how the situation is going to be resolved or what the best move to make is, but I'm sure that whatever Obama does will end up making us look even more weak on the world stage. Don't get me wrong, though. You know, I'm not advocating. What I am saying is that, you know, we are getting probed for weaknesses. You know, it seems to me like, you know, uh, we have just been getting, uh, you know, uh, picked at, kind of like how it was back in, uh, in the ancient Roman days when the barbarians were at the gates, literally. You know, they, they were, you know, testing the borders, seeing where, where weakness was, and when they found weakness, they would exploit it. So we have to be aware that our enemies are watching and waiting. They are really excited to just 
catch us in a moment of weakness and pounce. You know, the wolves are circling, and there has to be a sense of urgency. But I don't see that with this administration. I don't see Obama feeling any kind of sense of urgency at all. So, you know, I would really like to hear what you guys have to say about this. If you'd like to join the conversation, give us a call at 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at On The Move Show and give us your take on it. So, uh, with that said, I'm going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back in a few moments, and uh, we're going to take a call from uh, some of our listeners here at CBH. So, uh, we'll be right back. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lwhurleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lwhurleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwhurleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. All right, at this point, I'm going to bring on a guest on the show. He's a uh, frequent guest that we have. His name is Cowboy Josh. Are you there, sir? Yeah, I'm here. What's up, Mac? Ah, uh, you know, just uh, just uh, talking here. So uh, as far as uh, what, what you'd like to talk about, from what I understand uh, from uh, my producer, you'd like to talk about Ukraine. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, just talk about the whole situation um, with Ukraine and uh, apparently, Russian troops are infiltrating, and I, I'm not a hundred. I have I'm not real studied up on it. Uh, you know, the, the news is still breaking, but it sounds like, like you said, this administration is, does not have a sense of um, urgency. It just sounds like they think it's all a joke, you know. And I think they're doing that on purpose. We've seen um, this administration, and particularly, it seems to be the president. If you want to call him that? Um, just uh, trying to de-whittle our military and uh, kind of uh, defund certain portions of it. We've had high, high-end high uh, generals and people in our uh, military fired over little things, which be which is clearly a lie. Um, there's other things going on that they're not telling us about. And I think they're destabilizing it, and if Russia gets serious with us, we're going to be in a real, real hot mess real quick. Um, I have six months ago, we had the Obama saying he was going to strike Syria and all this hype, and we got them to back off on that. And I was freaked out then, but I'm way more freaked out now. This is a lot. This is a whole different story. It's a lot more Absolutely. involved. There's a lot more going on. So what do you think? Uh, so, do you think that we should uh, we should get militarily involved here and stop Russia from invading Ukraine, or should uh, we just stay oh, out of absolutely. it? Absolutely, absolutely not. I'm I I um I uh, run along the libertarian philosophy. Um, I go with what the founders said: stay out of foreign entanglement. You know, just defend the homeland. I'm a person that personally doesn't. I don't think we should be involved with anybody else. Um, other than maybe Canada, since they're connected to us, um, at all. I think we should have kept to ourselves from the beginning. Of course, we're a long way down the road, and that ain't going to happen. But um, I don't think we should We should try to stay out of it. If they come at us, then they come at us, and that's that. But um, I don't. I think we're going to – what's going to end up happening is either we're, we're going to um, – I think we're going to poke them with a stick. And I think if, if anything happens, we're going to poke them with a stick and it's going to be on. But I hope that doesn't happen. No one wants this. Um, well, so let, okay. Let it... I, I can understand where you're coming from. And, and you know, it, I'm kind of torn on this because I, I want us to look strong on the world stage. You know, I because I, I think 
we keep backing down every time that that uh, Putin's been poking us with a stick, basically. Uh, I'm not really sure how to handle this. Uh, I don't think it's a good a good idea to, to totally stay out of it, and I don't think it's a good idea to, to go to war, obviously, with Russia. I think that's a horrible idea. I, I don't yeah. really know what to do here. I, I think maybe yeah. – I mean, obviously, Stand negotiating strong. needs to happen. Yeah. But, but I don't know, I don't know big, what the answer is. Yeah, I think stand strong with a big stick, but don't – no particular use. It definitely don't look weak, but um, our administration is helping us look weak. There's been apparently – I don't know. I see things floating around, but I don't. I'm not hard facts on it. Something about our military being shrinked to free World War II size, but I think that's a rumor personally. But um, I know that there's things going on, and we, we may be looking weak. Um, so uh, we need to put on a, a a front, get aggressive, and say, "Hey, look, don't mess with us," but not not poke at them. So it's it's a tough thing to do. Um, and obviously. What we've seen this administration, many elements of our federal uh, gov- government, as we, as I like to call them, uh, I don't know. It's scary. It's all I know. Um, but one other thing you talked about is the storable food and everything. Because if this does go down, you know, start out with the rationing. I'm trying to get my hands on some storable food right now. I am going to go through uh, your site on the booth, uh, show dot com and go to uh, get some Mountain House very awesome. soon. Um, and I'm also going to try to get some uh, apparel um, uh, that you have uh, designed from uh, that's on Coffee, Cafe Fresh. Um, so I'm trying. I just got a new job. That's why I've been out of the loop a little bit lately. <laughs> I haven't yeah. been, I've been really busy. So, but, Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so um, we appreciate you, uh, you calling in and everything. Uh, you know, we love having you on the show. And yeah, you, you know we've had that mm-hmm. conversation about the the Cafe Press store and everything. Uh, CafePress.com yeah. slash show. Uh, you were telling me how you you liked all the designs on there and everything. Yeah, anybody anybody who's interested in liberty and and understands what the symbols and stuff that it says on any of that apparel or uh, product is gonna love it. It's the best thing I've seen. I I mean I, I'm a huge huge uh, I, I'm a huge Infowars guy and I think your stuff's better than them. And I've seen other stuff in other places. I think your stuff's just the greatest. So I'm trying oh, great. to scrape up some cash to get it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, so. We appreciate that. So uh, do you have anything else on your mind that you wanted to talk about, man? Um, one other thing is did you, um, that story you said uh, you were talking about where the guy had to be escorted out of the bar and he, he started opening fire. Uh, does it? Anywhere in that article disclosed if he was a concealed pistol license holder or was he just criminally um, hiding out the gun in the bar? You know, the the article I read, it didn't say anything about that, but I'm assuming you know, based on the facts that uh, that he actually, you know, what, wasn't mentioned to get arrested here because you know how they love to, to, to make that stuff uh, a big deal, how somebody was illegally carrying or something. So I'm guessing that, that he, yeah. he was a licensed. Uh, holder uh, or concealed carry holder, but you know it doesn't say specifically in the article. Right, I, I doubt he was, um, which is good. I I would not like to see any concealed carry holders uh, putting that bad kind of badge on that. Um, a lot of people go on about bar carry and this and that. I think they should be able to open carry in any bar in the country. Period. In a story, um, concealed I think should be completely outlawed in bars because the fact that there is alcohol involved. In, can still left, and that doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, I just wanted to know clarification if it said it in the article. But. No, no, yeah, it didn't say it. But you know, you and I are going to disagree when it comes to uh, concealed carry in bars and whatnot. Because you know, uh, as uh, somebody in our uh, our chat room says, you can't legislate safety, and that's absolutely true. You know, it, if somebody's going to conceal, they're going to conceal. They, in my opinion, there should be no such thing as a gun-free zone because criminals are going to have. Oh, absolutely. Guns. I'm not saying uh, it's gun-free zone. I think that as a private property, as a business establishment, that it would be a good, smart choice to say, hey, you can bring your gun in here, but we want it open. That's just the way it is. You know, I think that's what it would be like, and it's that's their choice to have that policy. Um, not there's not particularly a law, but a policy, and that gun owners would respect that. Um, that's just what I'm saying, because it did make it safe for everybody. Um, 
and that's how I think the bars should go. But and I'm not saying people should drink and drink and carry a weapon either. And that's not what I'm saying either. But there's plenty of bars I like to go to that have excellent food and just excellent people there and things like that. And so, but anyway, not to get off on a long rabbit trail on that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so. and, and as was just pointed out in the chat room, uh, you know, they're they're saying that the the gun owners aren't the problem. Uh, it's it's not legal gun owners that are the problem. Criminals are the problem, and I I absolutely agree with that. And, and you know, if absolutely. if a private business wanted to institute some kind of policy to where they don't want their their customers having a firearm in their facility or whatever, that's fine. That that's that's up to them. I don't have a problem with that, right. but I, you know, I just may choose not to, you know, participate in that business. Yeah, uh, and I'm not, One I'm not saying point. I advocate drinking and having a gun, but what I am saying is that if you're in a bar, you know, and you're following the, the law, you know, then then at that, point, what does it really matter? Uh, you know, it, yeah. as long as, uh, you know, as long as you're not, you know, hurting anybody or, or having some, affecting not, somebody's safety. Yeah. My as long as you're not criminally criminal, acting, exactly. Yeah, well, well right. my, my thing yeah, is that they, criminals are going to, to break the law because, by definition, they don't care what the law is. They're criminals. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's not a crime until uh, there's a victim or injured party. I understand what you're saying. I hear, I hear your philosophy, but one thing about the whole gun thing that we uh, want, I could bring up is this huge news is the Connecticut uh, deal. Um, yeah. You know, I've had, I've been I've been in discussions with people on Facebook over it because it's a huge ordeal. Now, people say, oh, if they come for the gun, you know, they should just shoot the police or whatever and this and that. Well, the one thing that I've learned through my whole research and being involved with radio shows like yours and with smart people like you is that at the highest levels of this corrupt, tyrannical system, that's what they want. They want a shootout between the police and the military working with the police and the citizenry. That's what they want. They control um, war so that, basically, a civil war so that they can bring in total, um, basically, the state can bring in total uh, tyranny on the people to, to keep it under control. It's, it's, a, uh, it's basically a false flag attack. Um, so I think that people in Connecticut, um, and, and, you know, I wish they could just, do that, but they can't. I think the best thing for them to do would be to take their guns out of state or hide them. If they do, you know, come to that confiscating like they're they're warning about, because once it all cools down, um, then they can um, find out a way to do something, you know, uh, politically or if, if it comes, you know. But I just don't think that people should be shooting each other over this. I think they should play it out smarter because that's what that's what the uh, the industrial uh, military complex wants. That's what DHS wants, you know. And a lot of people don't understand my point of view, but they're pushing buttons to to start it so that they can bring in full government, full and, government and, and regulation, you know, martial I, I law. I agree basically. with you it, it, as far as the government. You know, we are winning the information war, as Hillary Clinton has already said. You know it. They're looping, and they know it. So what they would like to do yeah. is to bait us into some kind of conflict. Now, as far as you know, shooting trap. police it's and a like trap. That, I, I, I'm not a fan of that, and, and I, I typically would say yeah. it's best just to get the gun out of there. But, it, you know, in my opinion, yeah. I'm not saying, you know, take your gun out of the state. I say take your feet out of the state. Vote with your feet. Move somewhere that's not going to violate yeah. your rights. You know, and, and I'm all I mean, for fighting, fighting the system and trying to – Affect change and everything like that, but you have to. Yeah. You have to. When you see the writing on the wall, you have to get the heck out of Dodge. Well, absolutely. But three hundred thousand people can't move over, move out of the state overnight, and this stuff's happening fast. Um, the best bet for these people, I wish every one of people, everybody in Connecticut could hear me, is get your guns out or hide them, so that and and later on, wait till it blows over, and then heck, if you want to. All three hundred thousand of you get out there and march on, march on your state capital and take over the government. I don't care, but you know, do it in a smart way, because you know, just sitting there waiting and starting something like that is not going to exactly what they want. They want that trap, and I wish I could tell everyone in Connecticut that, but I mean, I can't. So, well, I'm gonna you say know, on the show, I, I typically, so. 
you know, I, I typically would, would, would agree with, uh, with resistance and things like that. Uh, you, you know, one thing that I'd like to point out is that with the stroke of a pen, they, they made these people, you know, uh, basically felons if they decide not to turn this in. And, and I'm not advocating right. any kind of criminal activity. Uh, one thing that, that I would like to say is, is that, you know, these, these people uh, who are in that situation, it's a tough situation to be in. And, and I've said it on the last episode. I was talking about a possible, mm-hmm. like, what, what would it be like if the Kiev situation happened here in America? So what would happen – if these conservatives, these gun owners, you know, these libertarians, uh, if they all, you know, stormed the, the Capitol or whatever and, and held like a Kiev-style protest to, you know, to get these people out of power, you know, it, I think it would create that situation you were talking about where the government, you know, they're just waiting for that situation where, where there's some right. kind of violent outbreak right. or something and they can step in, um, take control, well, and, and you can get, you know, it, it, now on top of which – even if that was successful, like I said on the last episode, even if that kind of event was successful, can you imagine it, what it would be like for the, the actual conservatives out there or, or libertarians or people with a job like, you know, you and me, you know, we got to go to work on Monday. So this, that, that right. could last, you know, that could last at the very maximum until Monday morning, and then we all got to go right. to work. You know, a lot of us right. you know, have businesses. People are depending on us to survive. So a lot of people can't just call off of work, you know. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. We can't do the thing. We can't do the Kiev style thing here. It, it just doesn't work like that. If if we tried that, it's already rigged as a trap. That's what they want. They want something like that, and there's a trap waiting for us. There's you know a bear trap waiting for us. Um, like you you know it just mentioned. But yeah, if, there, if things keep going the way they are, we will have to go Kiev if things can't be changed politically, and that's what everyone's trying to do. That's what, you know, Alex Jones has been trying to get the police and military woken up, try to get them out of their their condition so that they won't go along with all this, so it it dismantles the trap. And that's what we got to keep pushing towards, this peaceful dismantling of the trap. And, you know, obviously we need to do civil disobedience but not civil acts of violence. Disobedience but not violence. And uh, that's what I'm trying to say about Connecticut. So yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and and one thing I'd like okay. to point out, it was mentioned in the the chat again. Uh, and and by the way, that's uh, that's Tank from Sounding Off with Tank and Tony here on Blog Talk Radio. She's the one that's been uh, commenting. Uh, she was saying that uh, that it's not only not just basically made uh, into felons, as I said, they are actually felons now if they're not reporting and registering their, their firearms. Uh, they're class four felons, which carries a one to five year uh, sentence in jail and a fine. So I find that pretty crazy that that with a stroke of a pen they've done that. But hey, Josh, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about, man? Oh, a ton. But I, I no, not really, not today. Oh, no, but uh, I can go on forever, but. I'll let you go, and uh, maybe maybe there's some other callers that are waiting to, you know, come on and stuff like that. So, all right, I'll, man. Well, uh, I appreciate you calling in, buddy. All right. Uh, God bless America, uh, and long live the republic. Heck yeah. All right, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. It. See you all later. Right. See you, man. All right. At this point, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, and uh, I will be right back. Don't go anywhere, everybody. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. We're back. Thank you for sticking with us. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to talk to you all about Jonathan Turley. So 
with that, uh, I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but uh, you know, I've, I, I've recently came across the, this gentleman, Jonathan Turley, and uh, he had a testimony that he gave uh, where he was condemning Obama's tactics, so the way that he's using executive powers. Uh, so one question is, who is Jonathan Turley? This is the information I pulled from jonathanturley.org in his bio. It's quite a bit of stuff here, so I'll try to go through it uh, and just kind of give you guys an idea because this guy is no slouch. This guy is, is somebody who should be paid attention to, okay? He's a professor. Professor Jonathan Turley is nationally rec recognized as a legal scholar who has written extensively in areas ranging from constitutional law to legal theory to tort law. He has written over three dozen academic articles that have appeared in a variety of leading law journals at Cornell, Duke, Georgetown, Harvard, Northwestern, and other schools. After a stint at Tulane uh, Law School, uh, Professor Turley joined the George Washington faculty in 1990 and in 1998 was given the prestigious Shapiro, Shapiro uh, Chair for Public Interest Law, the youngest chaired professor in the school's history. In addition to his extensive publications, Professor Turley has served as a counsel in some of the most notable uh, cases in the last two decades, ranging, uh, representing uh, whistleblowers, military perso personnel, and a wide range of other clients. He is also one of the few attorneys to successfully challenge both federal and state law, leading the court striking down the federal Elizabeth Morgan law, as well as the criminalization of cohabitation. In 2010, Professor Turley uh, represented Judge G. Thomas Porteous in his impeachment trial. After, after a trial before the Senate, Professor Turley, on December 7, 2010, argued uh, both the motions and gave the final arguments to all 100 senators from the, uh, from the floor of the U.S. Senate. This is only the 14th time in history of the country that such a trial has reached the Senate floor. Turley has, has served as a consultant on homeland security and constitutional issues, including the Florida House of Representatives. Uh, Professor Turley is a frequent witness before the House and Senate constitutional and statutory issues, as well as uh, tort reform legislation. So Professor Tur Turley is also nationally recognized as a legal commentator. Professor Turley was ranked as 38th in the top 100 most cited public intellectuals in the recent study by Richard Posner. Turley was also found to be the second most cited law, uh, law professor in the country. He has been repeatedly ranked in the nation's top 500 in annual surveys, including in the latest 2010 ranking by Law Dragon, uh, one of uh, only a handful of academics that had this happen. Uh, in prior years, he was ranked as one of the nation's top 10 lawyers in military cases, as well as one of the top 40 lawyers under 40. He was also selected in 2010, 2011, and 2012 as one of the top Irish lawyers in the world. His award-winning blog is routinely ranked as one of the most popular legal blogs by AVVO. His blog was selected as top news analysis site in uh, 2013, the top legal opinion blog in 2011, as well as prior selections as the top law professor blog and legal theory blog. It was regularly ranked by the ABA Journal in the top 100 blogs in the world. In 2012, Turley was selected as one of the top 20 experts by Twitter Business Insider. As you can see, his, his resume just keeps going and going and going. Uh, so I'm just going to skip to the end here and, and give you this. Uh, okay, so, so Turley is a lawyer, uh, and from the sound of his, his testimony that I'm about to play for you guys, he's a Democrat voter. He's not a politician. Mr. Turley supports President Obama on the issue, but he's now speaking out about how President Obama is damaging our republic. He's concerned that Obama is amassing too much power within the executive branch and threatening to do more with the use of executive orders. So I have the clip here from Jonathan Turley, and, and listen to it. Make sure you pay attention to this, because this is coming from an Obama supporter. Here it is. I testified at the earlier hearing about the separation of powers, its history and its function, and also my view that the president has in fact exceeded his authority in a way that is creating a destabilizing influence in a tripartite or three-branch system. Now I want to emphasize, of course, that this problem didn't begin with President Obama. I was critical of uh, his predecessor, President Bush, as well. But the rate at which executive power is being concentrated in our system is accelerating. 
And frankly, I am very alarmed uh, by the implications of that aggregation of power. What also alarms me, however, is that the two other branches appear not just simply passive but inert uh, in the face of this concentration of authority. The fact that I happen to think the president is right on many of these policies does not alter the fact that I believe the means he is doing is wrong and that this can be a dangerous uh, change in our system. And our system is changing in a very fundamental way. And it's changing without a whimper of regret or opposition. And so it, it's a great honor to speak with you again today about the implications, uh, but also about what this branch can do uh, to assert uh, its uh, powers and to regain balance in the system. I am a typical Madisonian scholar. I tend to view all branches as equal, but some more equal than others, and that would be the legislative branch. If you take a look at Article 1 and Article 2, even a glance, you'll see what I mean. The framers, particularly James Madison, spent a great deal of time developing this institution. Uh, it is the thumping heart of our system, and it has lost a great deal of power. Uh, and that power has largely been transferred to the executive branch. Before I talk about those options, I just simply want to note priorities and policies, and yes, even presidents, change. Our system is not supposed to change. It's the guarantee that we all have. It's an article of faith that we have with one another. It is a thing that has weathered wars and depression and social unrest. In our system, there is no license to go it alone. There's no freelancing. That doesn't mean that this is not difficult. It doesn't mean that, that we don't have divisions. I want to emphasize that last point. Recently, Congress has seemed, frankly, feckless and uncertain as to its authority. It surprises me, given the institution created by people like James Madison. I do not, however, believe our dysfunctional government, as it currently exists, uh, is simply the result of dysfunctional politics. It is simply untrue that we're living in very different or unprecedented times. The framers lived in these times. Well, people say you're acting like you want to kill one another. When the framers first joined this institution, they were literally trying to kill each other. They were using things like the Alien and Sedition Act to try to arrest their opponents. Thomas Jefferson referred to his opponents as the reign of the witches. This is not a different political time, and it shouldn't be used as an excuse for extra constitutional action. Indeed, the branch that I blame the most for the problems we're having is the branch that's rarely mentioned, and that is the judicial branch. It was once referred to as the least dangerous branch, but has made itself into the least relevant branch after reigns and other cases. Specifically, it has created barriers for member standing or legislative standing, which I think is key if we're going to rebalance the system. What is strange is that the Supreme Court has dealt with this uh, by saying they're defending separation of powers by refusing to reinforce it. It's like a fire department refusing to put out fires because only you can prevent fire fire fires. They're, they are tasked with the job of maintaining the separation of powers. I have listed the options uh, in my testimony that this body can consider, uh, from direct legislative means uh, to things like appointments to some of the legislation that is pending. I do want to emphasize one thing, however, in closing. This common article of faith that we have in our system has served us well. The short-term insular victories that are achieved in this term will come with prohibitive costs. I happen to agree with many of those policies, but I do not agree with the means. I believe we are now at a constitutional tipping point in our system. It's a dangerous point for our system to be in, and I believe that your response has to begin before this president leaves office. No one in our system goes it alone. Now, in close. So Jonathan Turley is saying that we are at a constitutional tipping point and we're either going to go one way or the other. We're either going to go into a, a situation where our constitution is reaffirmed or it's just going to be totally dissolved. You know, it, this right here, 
this is something that we really need to pay attention to right now. We have a supporter of Obama bashing the way that he's trying to usurp power. Jonathan Turley is basically saying that the ends do not justify the means, which is something that progressives don't agree with. And I find that, that odd that somebody as smart as Mr. Turley, Professor Turley, uh, can actually still be a part of the Democrat Party as a voter or a supporter while not being a progressive. Because progressives, they do not believe that the ends don't justify the means because they, they actually do. If you just look at Saul Alinsky, look at Rules for Radicals. Saul Alinsky wrote Rules for Radicals. In his second chapter of that book, Alinsky proposed a new question for community organizers to consider when bringing activist groups together. Normally, when looking to achieve a certain goal, organizers would ask, do the ends justify the means? Alinsky stated, the real question for what methods are acceptable for accomplishing a goal should be, does this particular end justify this particular means? His purpose here, and for the rest of the chapter, is to, chapter is to, de, to delve into a, the goal of setting and achieving for a community organizing. As a strong proponent for direct actions, action tactics, Alinsky held to the idea that unorthodox methods uh, – I can't speak again. Sorry, guys. Uh, all right. Alinsky held to the idea that unorthodox methods for effecting change were acceptable. Uh, if the actions undertaken uh, brought to light the problem of a community was facing, then uh, the means were acceptable. So uh, he's basically saying that if, if you actually accomplish your goal, then, you know what, whatever, whatever you had to do to get to that point, it's okay. Uh, he believes that once a particular goal is set, the means necessary to achieve it, given the community involved, become more apparent and easier to discern if, not, if appropriate or not. So, you know, President Obama and Alinsky uh, – you know, I'm sorry, President Obama, like Alinsky, is a ideologue. Progressives in general are actually ideologues. So what do I mean by that? What, what does that actually mean? You know, that means that they won't divert from their agendas that they have, even if it hurts their constituents, because the ends justify the means. They don't care if they hurt the country. They only care about getting a stronger hold on it. You know, if they have to weaken our country in order to have more control over it, then so be it. And if we see Obama and the progressives, you know, it, we see them systematically weakening our country. They're cutting our military during a time of uh, increased tensions in the world. Uh, it was said, uh, like uh, Josh mentioned, uh, Obama wants to take our military back to the numbers before World War II. I don't know if that's, if, if that's rumor or not, but that's what I've been hearing. You know, they're expanding Medicaid. You know, they're putting even more stress on this overextended program. They've significantly relaxed the requirements to receive Medicaid. So that's something to be concerned about, too, because this program is already overstressed, overworked. Obamacare is the number one killer of jobs in America. It's decimating our economy right now. It's forcing employers to lay off employees and cut hours. It's causing hundreds of thousands of Americans, if not more, to lose their health insurance. We have 92 million out of 370. I'm sorry, 317 Americans who are not working. 92 million Americans are out of work. One out of every five American men are out of work. We have 47 million Americans on food stamps. They keep spinning us further and further into debt. They're basically ensuring that our children will essentially be slaves you know, to this debt that we have accumulated for them. According to Forbes, we have over $127 trillion in un unfunded liabilities. We have $17 trillion in debt and growing every day. We can't seem to balance a budget. We, we cannot seem to, to get anybody to fight to rein in spending. You know, progressives, they also want amnesty for illegal immigrants. Of course they do. That's nearly 20 million new Democrat voters. And the progressives in the GOP are totally okay with this. They actually support Amnesty, and yes, you didn't hear me right. I said progressives in the GOP. I'm talking about McCain and others like him. I'm talking about all these these rhinos in there, and and even people like um uh, oh shoot, I can't remember his name. Uh, I was talking about him on the last show. He's got uh, Huckabee, Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee is a is a uh, progressive in the GOP. Mike Huckabee is not a conservative. And that's the thing that these progressives like to do is they like to put a label on things that, that don't apply. You know, they like everything is misdirection. Every single thing is misdirection. So 
you know, they label themselves conservatives because they want conservatives to vote for them, but they're not. They're they're not. And they, but they don't like it when you label them what they really are. For example, Mike Huckabee, he got really upset when people uh, labeled him as a as a rhino. And he's like, well, hey, don't call me a rhino. Who are you to say that that I'm not a, a conservative? What do you hold the market on conservative values? No, that's that's not the way it is. There is a there's basically a checklist. Are you conservative? Do you believe this? Do you believe that? If you believe the other, then you're not a conservative. Especially if you go down the line and you you have a lot of values that don't beat conservative values, you can't call yourself a conservative. But he seems to think that you can. But like all uh, all Democrats or all progressives, excuse me, uh, like all progressives, they are ideologues. You know this is this is why I think progressives are ideologues. Or they're just plain dumb. You have to be. You know, any member of the GOP that actually thinks that 20 million voters, if you if you pass amnesty, will vote Republican, has to be as dumb as can be. You know, the more likely scenario is that, like all progressives, you know, they believe that the ends justify the means. These Republicans, these rhinos, they know they're not they're not going to vote Republican because they also know that. That the Democrats are prepared to do more, they will always give more. They're always going to have be able to give somebody a handout. They will they will always be willing to do more than the Republican Party is. So why would they do this? You know, it's because the ends justify the means. They are prepared to lose the next election. They're prepared to lose the next the next decade's elections. Why? Because if weakening the party allows them to gain more control over it, then that's exactly what they'll do. Does that sound like a familiar tactic? When they lose, and they will lose hard if they pass amnesty, they will lose so hard, they will simply blame the Tea Party. They'll say it was the Tea Party's fault that they're losing elections, the Tea Party is extreme, and they've caused all this infighting, and they've basically made it so that, that we can't compete you know, it, it because we're arguing with each other and burning each other's, you know, uh, others' platforms down. They will blame the Tea Party. It will be the Tea Party's fault, and and they will continue this argument. They're not going to back down from, from their argument. They'll continue to to basically try to destroy the Tea Party and do everything that they can to discredit the Tea Party. When in reality, it's the actions that they've taken to ensure their own demise and their inaction has alienated their conservative voting base. They don't care if they destroy the GOP because they're ideologues, and you can't reason with ideologues. So anyway, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we get back, I'm going to discuss this some more. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support need design services logo design for ninety dollars business cards brochures bumper stickers signs flyers promotional products such as mugs pins bags Keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T O S H A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. I appreciate you guys sticking with us. So when we last left, we were talking about ideologues. So I'd like to bring this back to Jonathan Turley. I think it's important to note that a Democratic voter is speaking out against Obama's constitutional violations. This shows the difference between ideologues and reasonable people. You know, when re- when reasonable people see things like how Obama is usurping power – how other branches of, gov- uh, of the government are not doing anything to stop him, and how they're actually complicit with Obama. Also, how Obama threatens to 
violate the Constitution with more executive orders, a normal person would be appalled. But an ideologue, they're not appalled. They'll just find some way to justify it because that's what ideologues do. That is the difference between a normal, reasonable person and a progressive ideologue. So since we're on the subject of ideologues, let's talk about Joe Biden. Vice President Joe Biden was recently on The View, the show The View, and he was asked about how Obamacare will cost American jobs. He actually tried to put a spin on the fact that these people are going to lose jobs, and he tried to make it a good thing. This is what I was just saying about how these these people will do whatever. You know, it's all propaganda and rhetoric when it comes to these guys. So here's Joe Biden's interview on The View. You guys hear it for yourself, and you decide what, uh, what you want to decide on this. So uh, here it is. Yeah. So I want to start, of course, with Ob- – not of course, but uh, Obamacare, which has been the most controversial aspect of the president's uh, program since he was in office. Uh, there were glitches. People lost their current plans and doctors. And now a recent congressional report found that Obamacare will cost more than 2 million Americans to quit their jobs – have to cut their hours. Is it a job killer, Obamacare? It, look, this is a really good report. Now, let me explain what I meant. When That's you get beyond, no, let me explain why. You get beyond the headline, mm-hmm. about 2,000 jobs will be lost. Mr. Elmendorf, the guy who runs the Congressional Budget Office, when he testified, pointed out, this is about freedom. How many of you are single women with children in a dead-end job? You're there because of your health insurance. You would rather have the opportunity to spend the next couple of years with your child till they get, if that was your choice, till they get into primary school. You're now trapped in that job because if you leave, you lose your health insurance. Now, you'll be able to do, make an independent choice. Do you want to stay in that job and still have health insurance? Or do you want to, I mean, do you, do you want to stay in that job or even though you can get health insurance absent that job? Right. And it gives women a great deal more freedom. But but why is it such a mess coming out? And why is it such a controversial... I think think two things, Barbara. Again, you know, I'm I'm prejudiced. I mean, I think it's a great program. But there's never been any major fundamental change in social policy in America Mm -hmm. that's rolled out without trouble. When it was Social Security, it was initially widows that only people covered. Medicare, even the program that President Bush came out with on Medicaid uh, health for prescription drug costs. It all takes time. It's a massive, massive move. But here's the end of the deal. If you think about it, and I don't know how many of you, I bet every one of you know somebody who didn't have health insurance or had inadequate health insurance or had a deductible so high you'd have to basically mortgage your house again to pay the first round. It's the peace of mind that this gives to people. I've been going around the country, Barbara, and I've been meeting. I go every town I go into, no matter what the purpose is, I meet with in a a local restaurant or a diner, mostly women who are, they call navigators, and women who have recently gotten into the health exchange for the first time. It's life-changing. I was recently with a woman in Minneapolis whose daughter is anorexic. Now, she had coverage as long as her daughter is in her health, on her health care plan because they can't be denied until she's 20. She can right. stay on. Right. But she's about to go off. Mm-hmm. Nobody pick her up. Bye. Nobody pick her up. Well, yeah, I know that you have a key message that you want to get out to, to a key group of people for, uh, for Obamacare, which is moms and young adults. So is there something that you want to say to them about Obamacare? Thanks for the prompt. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the, the truth is that uh, no matter how old we get, we still listen to our moms. And that sounds corny, but it's true. And there's no influence on a son or a daughter as 28 or 29 years old feeling physically invincible. Why should I go out and pay mm-hmm. even if I can afford it at $300 a month or $400 a month? Why should I go get health insurance? I'm invincible. Well, I can tell you, I thought I was invincible as a young man, as a senator. I was diagnosed with a with a cranio. I, I needed a craniotomy. I had a a serious, serious, two serious problems. I had aneurysms in my head. Mm. My bills exceeded over six hundred thousand mm. bucks. What would have happened had I not had insurance? 
So moms have great influence. Call your sons and daughters. Tell them. Sign up. It's for them, and it's for your mom's peace of mind. Well, why do you think young people are uh, are not flocking? Because I would think, I mean, all I wanted was health care when I was a young mother. All I wanted for you know, my kid was health care. Probably because you knew people who didn't have health Yes, that's probably right. No, I'm not being facetious. I mean, probably because you saw the devastation that occurs when you don't have health care. Right. But look, an awful lot of young people, first of all, how many of your 28-year-old kids, and I know no one out there is old enough to have anybody 28, but 28-year-old kids, how many of them think, geez, I may get sick tomorrow, Mom, I, I should be out there paying for health insurance? That's number one. Number two, they think the cost is much higher than it is right. in these exchanges. Right. They're, they're two of the reasons why they're not signing up, but yet 25% have signed up so far. 25% of that population has signed up. And uh, I just wanted to mention a little something while I have time. Um, I was talking to my son last night, Evan, who's 11 years old, and I said, do you know what the job of the vice president is? And he said, yeah, he has to attend a lot of funerals. Yeah. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, well, you know what? I'm going to make you watch so you can tell him what you want your legacy to be. Well, you know, I want my legacy to be what I signed on for. A... A vice president has no inherent power. It's all reflective power. It all depends on the relationship with the president of the United States. Barbara, I know you're a bit of a scholar of presidential administrations, and you've known a lot of, I mean, sincerely, you know a lot of vice presidents who've had zero power, weren't even invited into the Oval Office. We're, we're not. The relationship I've had with the president is he has given me uh, major assignments, carte blanche to take any assignment that I am given and do it my way. And, the, and, and, and it works because we're ideologically compatible and we're personal, very close personal friends. So in that sense, it's rewarding. So, for example, when it came to ending the war in Iraq, in the middle of a meeting with all the national security team, they came up with a, it was uh, Hillary and Bob Gates and everyone, and they said, we have a plan. He said, no, no, Joe will do Iraq. I didn't know it. Was, so Joe did Iraq, and my job was to end the war on the Recovery Act, which was almost a trillion dollars. I made a mistake of writing him a note as how he should handle it. He slipped it back down the dining room table and said, okay, do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it's the last memo I sent. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. yeah, I, I, want about, I want to ask you about the, the power that you have and may have in the future. I do not expect you to come in this program and announce that you're going to run for president. I, I, I won't object if you want to. Do you want to? <laughs> i tell you what. Make you a deal. If you stick around, I will announce my decision oh, with you. Oh, oh. I'm not sure that's a deal I can accept. <laughs> it's very, very flattering. So let me, try it. let me try it coming in backwards. If Hillary does not run, Will you, you have said that if she runs for president, you will not run. No, I haven't. Oh, no, then no. tell me what you well, said. The only reason to run for president of the United States is if you truly believe you're a better position to do what you think is most needed in the country. I think my knowledge of foreign policy, my engagement with world leaders, my experience is uh, uniquely positions me to be, uh, to follow through on the agenda Barack and I have of bringing up world peace in a way that is real and substantive. I also think the middle class is the single, the single focus, what we should be looking at and how to grow it. So, so, and so, so whether she runs or not will not affect my decision. But does that mean, that, I mean, they're saying to me, push him, push him, so I'm pushing you. Push him. Does that mean that you will what run you, I tell you, if it's the, not the, dependent the, on the, her? The honest to God truth is that the first objective here is the win that keep the House, I mean, win the House and keep the Senate, because if we don't do that, our agenda is not going to be worth very much in the last two years. The second piece of this is it, a, a three years is four lifetimes in a presidential campaign. And this ultimately becomes a family decision, and uh, my wife is supportive. And uh, if but I. But you haven't said no. No, I absolutely have not said no. <laughs> it's as likely I run as I don't run. I just yeah. truly haven't made up my mind. The good news is. Everything I think I would have to do to be a viable candidate is the same exact thing I should be doing to be the best vice president I could possibly be.
that's uh, the term, Vice President, and, and uh, a, a very, a, the audience obviously appreciates that, and we appreciate so much for coming on with us. We are all honored to have you. Oh, I love being here. Thank we you. thank you. Anytime you want to come back. Wow. Okay. So here's one thing that I'm, I really want one day. I would love to have a mixing desk so I can pause things and talk to you guys and, and analyze them as they happen. So I know that was a big clip, but there's a lot in there that I want to tear apart. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you guys sticking with me through that, but I wanted you guys to hear everything on it. The very first thing I would like to comment on is the fact that Barbara Walters seems to think that Joe Biden is a good president or vi vice president. <laughs> I'm I'm just so blown away. This guy's a bumbling idiot, and I'm I'm confident that he's going to be looked back in history as one of the most idiot-like pre vice presidents we've ever had. One of the dumbest people that have ever been anywhere near the White House, to include the White House lawn. I, I honestly, this guy is a moron, and I'm trying to be nice right now. Honestly, I'm trying to be as nice as possible. So. Anyway, yeah, it, you know, I Tank right now. Tank is in the uh, the chat room, and she says, "Hey, people want to impeach Obama. You know, that's who's going to be in there if we impeach him. You know, honestly, I'd rather have a bumbling idiot in the office than who we have now in the office because he's actively trying to weaken the country. You know, so and, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think they they both need to to, to go. It's not one of those lesser of uh, of two evils kind of thing. You know, this they both are doing criminal actions. First of all. But but second of all, you know, they're both ideologues, like I've been saying. So anyway, so did you hear Biden? He's trying to actually say that it's a good thing that women are now unemployed. He's trying to put that ideologue spin on it again that I was talking about. You know, hey, everybody, it's a good thing that, that women are unemployed. He's trying to make it seem like he he's bestowed a gift to women that, you know, now they can spend more time with their children. You have more family time. Isn't that so nice of Biden to, to give that to us? Biden wants us to believe that being unemployed means being free. You know, that that right there is upsetting to me. Uh, just the whole concept of, of a leader of our country saying that it's a good thing to be unemployed. You have more freedom. You know, you, you can choose to do what you want. Now you don't have to work. Go ahead and latch on to the government teeth. We'll provide for you because, you know, that's what we do. We look out for you because, you know, you people are too stupid to make up your own minds. That's why we'll protect you and take away your guns. But you're also too dumb to have your own job and, and you know, provide for yourself, your own family. Now you can spend more time with your family. You can watch your American Idol and, and not have to worry about having one of those pesky jobs. You know, one other thing that he said is that, that uh, you know, he was basically trying to, like, come up with a reason why young people aren't, you know, getting Obamacare. He was trying to basically make it seem like uh, young people feel like they're invincible and how that, that may actually be a reason. Young people in America aren't stupid. You know, they aren't start signing up for Obamacare because deductibles are insane. Who wants to pay $6,000 in deductibles but before you'd even be able to use your health insurance? Not to mention that the premiums are insane. They're double and triple what they used to be. And, and why is that? It's because young people are subsidizing people who are using their health care, old people. Young people are dumb. You know, granted, young people are young, so they, they probably aren't sick. They're probably not using their health ins insurance very often. So why would a young person want to pay double and triple premiums and what we used to pay, so a crap load of money, not to mention – they have to pay out of pocket because it's deductible. You know, every time they go into the doctor for a checkup, which maybe will be one or two times a year on average, you know, every now and then there will be a young person that's going to be sick and going in their office. But yeah, on average, young people don't use their health insurance, which is why they have this feeling of invincibility because they don't, they aren't sick on average. You know, they are healthy and they can go years without seeing the doctor. So why would they want to pay so much money in premiums and deductibles and not see any benefit from it because they aren't stupid. Young people aren't stupid, even though, you know, they would like us to believe that they are. All right. Biden also, he also said that growing the middle class should be his single focus. Is this a joke? 
you know, they're systematically destroying the middle class. In this interview, he talks about how it's a good thing that Obamacare is destroying American jobs and making the middle class unemployed. Then he goes on to talk about how he's looking out for the middle class. He's trying to actually grow it. Does this seem ridiculous to anyone? I'd, I'd really like to hear what you guys have to say. Give me a call, 619-924-0986. Again, 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at com. You know, and, and what's this nonsense about him bringing about world peace? Does Joe Biden, does crazy Joe Biden actually think that he's in, competing in some kind of beauty pageant? I think that's what he is. It's like, oh, I'd like to have world peace. And, you know, here comes the applause. It's honestly no surprise to me or anyone else that's been paying attention, I'm sure, that this is coming from crazy Joe Biden. Every time that Biden opens up his mouth, he shows just how ignorant he is and how he doesn't think before he speaks. Okay, I have a clip here from Joe Biden. It is freaking hilarious. Uh, this is what Joe Biden was, was trying to tell us that we don't need to have guns. Uh, we don't need an assault rifle. And I'm using Cody fingers here, everybody, you know, in the air right now, Cody fingers, assault rifles. So he's trying to say that, that an AR-15 is an assault rifle, first of all, and that's, that's the thing. They like those labels. They like to label things with terrorizing words or emotionally sounding words. But anyway, he's suggesting that you don't need an assault rifle. You should just get a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. Here's Biden. Do you believe that banning certain weapons and high-capacity magazines will mean that law-abiding citizens will then become more of a target to criminals, as we will have no way to sufficiently protect ourselves? <laughs> is this, Fer- is this, came up is again this Parents again. Magazine? It is. I have Parents Magazine at home. I've never heard anybody in Parents Magazine ask these kinds of questions, but I'm delighted to answer them. Um, first of all, uh, the idea that... W- repeat the last part of the question, please. So she's asking if... Um, a ban goes into effect on certain kinds of weapons and high-capacity magazines. And what's her name? Um, her, Kate. Kate, if you want to protect yourself, get a double-barrel shotgun, have the shells, a 12-gauge shotgun, and I promise you, as I told my wife, we live in an area that's wooded and somewhat secluded. I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony here or walk out, put that double-barrel shotgun and fired two blasts outside the house. I promise you, who's ever coming in is not going to... You don't need an AR-15. It's harder to aim. It's harder to use. And, in fact, you don't need 30 rounds to protect yourself. Buy a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. Just buy one. Go, go on. Buy one. What's your freaking problem? Buy a shotgun. Look, I'm not going to take any advice from him, all right? And he, here's another another fact that I would like to point out, is these progressives that are out there gun-grabbing and trying to take away your rights, these guys, they don't even understand the technology of guns. They're trying to tell you that, that this gun is an assault rifle when it, it is a, it's a gun that has the technology that has been developed for hundreds of years now. You pull the trigger once, a bullet goes. You release the trigger, you pull it again, a bullet goes. It's not fully automatic. It's not like that. Oh, so, so here's the thing: is these people are so ignorant in the actual function and use of shotgun or of weapons in general, any weapons, you know. And on top of which, uh, he also said shortly after that interview, he said in Field and Stream in another interview on February 25th, 2013. This is an exact, exact excerpt from him speaking. To keep someone away from your house, just fire a shotgun through the door. (laughs) Biden continually proves that you can be both an ideologue and an idiot at the same time. Also, did you hear when Biden was on The View and, and he was talking about how he and Obama are ideologically compatible? That's because they're both ideologues. And they don't even attempt to hide it. There are his words right there ideologically compatible, all right? That is the only reason why crazy Joe Biden is trying to spin the loss of American jobs as a good thing. You know, he's absolutely right when he said that he was prejudiced about the program. Progressives will never admit 
Obamacare is a, is a bad program. Because to them, again, the ends justify the means. They will always spin bad news to make it look better. And when there is no way to spin it, they'll say, who cares? Why are you making a big deal out of this? This is unimportant. Get off my back. You know, and, and they'll try to downplay what, what's going on. I have a clip here of Hillary Clinton doing that exact thing. We are engaged in an information. Oh, that was the wrong clip. Here's the right clip. I, still, again, I'm, again, we no. were misled that there was supposedly protest and then something sprang out of that, an assault sprang out of that. And that was easily obta- ascertained I, that that was not the fact. But, but, and the American know, people could have known that within days, and, and they, they didn't know that. With all due respect, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it I because understand. of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again, Senator. Now, So right there, I mean, you, you see them right there basically deflecting. Hillary's talking about the attack on the American embassy in Benghazi. What difference does it make that our government lied to us about why we were attacked, right? Really? Well, I mean, what difference does it make that it, why Americans were killed? Who cares, right, Hillary? No. This kind of stuff is it's important. And when asked with a question that they can't spin anything good and they can't create a lie about it because they're, they're backed in a corner, they will just shrug it off and pretend like it doesn't matter and make you the weirdo for actually caring about why Americans died instead of just you know, going along with whatever their narrative is. You know, this, is this is what really gets me upset about the, these ideologues is that you can't reason with them. You just can't. You know, as I said before, progressives are ideologues, and because of that, they aren't bound by common sense. The progressive ideologues aren't trying to make it easier for Americans to make a living. They're trying to make it easier for you to live without being able to provide for yourself. You know, they want you on government programs. They want you on the team because they want to have control over you. It's about buying your votes. They create the problem, and they become the solution. There is no such thing as a dead-end job, contrary to what, oh, uh, I'm sorry, what Joe Biden would like you to believe. You, know, you take something with you from every job that you work at. I believe in the old saying, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. But the progressives, they don't subscribe to that. Progressives, they prefer the saying, de-incentivize a man to work by giving him a fish every day, and you buy his vote for life. So, you know, also, you know, one thing I'd like to mention, and it really kind of, you know, irks me that politicians are doing this, but what is it with American politicians refusing to answer whether they're going to run for the president? I I don't understand (laughs) Why is this a big thing? We all know that you're going to run for the president, Mr. Biden. We all know that Hillary's going to try again. We all know that you know Ted Cruz is probably going to run, Rand Paul, uh, Chris Christie, all these people, they're going to run. Why are they acting like they're not going to run? It's not just the left, it's the right, too. You know, it, this right here is, is really frustrating to me because it just shows it's the political game. You know, I want somebody, and, you know, I'm going to bash on Ted Cruz here, and this is a rare occurrence, guys. I never bash on Ted Cruz because, really, it's hard to find something wrong with that man. But he's doing the same thing. He's playing the same game, all right? Come on, man. You're supposed to be above this stuff, all right? You're supposed to be, like, for the people, you know, uh, you know, not, not one of these corrupt politicians that keep playing this crappy game. And you know what? i got to blame this on George Washington. Not that he started this as far as, you know, pretending you're not going to, but George Washington, back in the day, uh, George Washington actually didn't want to be in the the position of the president. He didn't want it. All he wanted to do was retire and be a farmer. After he won the, the, the War of Independence, you know, he retired. He didn't want anything to do with politics, and he was just a farmer. And, you know, interesting fun fact here, uh, he actually invented the mule. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, where he took a, uh, a female horse and he, he uh, paired it with a male donkey and he, he created the mule. Uh, that was George Washington. And, you know, 
a lot of people don't know that, but he was actually he was really into farming. He really enjoyed it, and he wanted that to be his life's work. But after that time, he was brought in because of the chaos after it created a power vacuum after the, the American Revolution, uh, and the states were having problems. It was actually it wasn't positive if, they, if America was going to survive, if they were going to stay together as one United State. So anyway, George Washington, he was really not interested in the position of power, but he knew that he was being called and somebody had to do it. Somebody had to be the, the figurehead for this, and they picked him because he gave up his power. George Washington could have been king. He could have been king of America. In fact, he had some of his aides say, you know, it, it bring up the fact that he could be that, and he told them never mention that again, and he was angry at that person. George Washington did not want power. Uh, uh, the king of England, he said if George Washington gives up his power, you know, he's the greatest man that's ever lived. And George Washington gave up his power, gave up the power back to the people. When he was called to be the president, he was called reluctantly. He didn't want to be the president, but he felt it necessary that he step up and do the job because they were, there was a lot of concern that there was going to be a coup and a lot of people would try to take the power, and they wanted a figurehead there that they knew that, they, that the people would trust that it wasn't about a power grab. And George Washington, he fit the bill. He was the only person – that they could use in that scenario. So George Washington stepped up, he did the job, and he became the president. After eight years, there was no term limit. that He could have been the president for life, but he created the, the situation where after eight years, he retired, and he went back to being a farmer. And one interesting fact, George Washington, he was actually fearful his entire life that he would do something that would ruin his reputation. So he lived his life in fear after the presidency because he had this kind of like, um, an iconic, you know, brand basically. So he didn't want to do anything to taint that. He wanted to live, it like live uh, his his legacy through history. He he enjoyed that, but he didn't want the power. So I'm kind of going off on a rant, getting far in the weeds here. But my point is, you know, George Washington, he was the one that created this reluctant politician. You know, he was oh, I don't really want to do it. Oh, all right, I'll be a politician. You know, so. You know, it carried on from Thomas Jefferson and so forth. And, and now, you know, we see it now, the same tradition we see in our politicians. And, you know, everybody's trying to emulate George Washington. And it really is, is bothersome to me that we can't just find somebody who will be honest and open with us and tell us, yeah, I'm going to run for president. I fully plan on doing that. I don't understand what the harm is of that. But honestly, you buy a lot more uh, – a, a lot more credibility with me anyway if you would just freaking, you know, come clean with it. So, all right, guys, at this point we're going to take another commercial break. We'll be back in about a minute 30. Don't go anywhere. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Need design services? Logo design for $90, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, signs, flyers, promotional products such as mugs, pins, bags, keychains, magnets, and so much more. Contact Latasha Worley for a quote on your next project at Tasha, T-O-S-H-A, at lworleyphotography.com today. Or visit me on the web at lworleyphotography.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com slash lworleyphotography. And on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tasha Worley. Show your support for a designer who believes in the Constitution and your rights. And we're back. I appreciate you guys sticking with us. Okay, so we got the last 21 minutes of the show here. We're going to wind this thing down. Uh, it's going to lead us to the, the next, next segment that, of the show that we're going to start here, and it's called the Listener Challenge. I challenge you to a duel. Did you hear that? Sounds like it's time for a challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. Listener Challenge. All right, this is a segment of the show that I like to give you guys a mission, get you out there doing something, getting active. Your mission this week 
if you choose to accept it, is to read your Constitution. Simple as that. Just read it. Open that thing up. And if you don't have a physical copy of the Constitution, feel free to check out onthemoveshow.com. Click the shop link. Go to our Amazon store, the gear store that we have on there. And on there, we have a, a pocket Constitution for sale. And it's going for a dollar. One dollar. I mean, anybody can afford it. There's no excuse for you to not to have a pocket Constitution. Carry it with you around at all times. Or... You know, get you know, get a little Kindle or something if you're going to carry that around, a Kindle or whatever that you know, whatever the new tech is. <laughs> but yeah, you know, carry it with you. Have a Constitution with you at all times. That way you can reference it. Educate yourself. You know, it's the founding document of our country. It's the supreme law of the land, and we have to know it. You know, the government they're not going to take the time to explain it to us. You know, it behooves them to keep us ignorant about the Constitution. With that said, it is of paramount importance that we all learn this document we must understand it this is why i got together with my local community and created a constitutional study group if you're interested in in checking out what we've done in the constitution group here the constitutional study group here you can watch uh the videos that i have on the youtube channel youtube.com forward slash on the move show uh so I have right now, I believe i got three sessions that we have. We've had four sessions. I haven't posted the fourth session yet, but I will get around to it. It takes a little bit of time to edit and everything and get it all converted. Uh, but if you're in the Vancouver area and you're interested in, in getting more information on how to attend our constitutional study group, just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash uh, constitutional study group, okay? Or you can email me at talk at on the move show dot com and if you don't have Facebook, you know, I will provide all the information you'll need to actually, you know, get there. And, and I'll put you on some kind of, like, newsletter mailing list where you know exactly when and where we're having the, the constitutional study group. So, also, if you're interested in starting your own and you'd like some advice on how to get it started, please feel free to email me at talkitonthemoveshow.com. I will do my best to help you set one up in your area. So, you know, if, if you guys have anything else you'd like to say, you'd like to join the conversation for the last uh, last few minutes of the show here, we've got about 18 minutes left in the show, uh, go ahead and give us a call. The telephone number to the show is 619-924-0986. Again, that is 619-924-0986. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. All right, so with that said, uh, we have a couple of clips here that I'd like to play for you guys. Uh, one of them is Ronald Reagan. He's he's given a speech about socialized medicine, and you know one thing I like about Ronald Reagan is that you can you can go back and you can listen to some of the things that he said, and it really relates a whole lot as far as what we see today. You know Ronald Reagan was uh, discussing, and I've played it a, a couple times on the show before. He has a clip about how the Republicans need to be a bold color difference. Okay that we need to uh, ha have re a Republican Party that actually represents something different so the voters can tell and they go out there and actually vote, you know. And and that's why, you know, I, I, I asked the, the question today in the quick poll, are we, you know, a, a, as, a, as people who may or may not vote Republican, you know, is the Republican Party, uh, is it is it going to, to hell, basically? Is it is it falling apart now, all right? Uh because we have all this infighting, because we have the Republican establishment, you know, causing all this this problem, attacking the Tea Party, all these things, is it time for a new political party? Is it time for maybe maybe us to start voting, uh, you know, libertarian? Uh, and, and the more I've been I've been like researching and talking to people, uh, you know, it's <laughs> libertarian party is looking better and better, and it's it's becoming the ideal uh, the ideals the principles are becoming more mainstream. Uh, it, a lot of people are able to really understand it, and for a, a long time, I didn't understand what a libertarian was. I didn't even know what it was at all. You know, I heard libertarian, and I was like, I, I don't know what that is. That, and so, was that Green Party? I, I don't know. I, 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 to this day, I don't know anything about the Green Party. I still have no clue what those guys represent. But you know, it, as far as uh, it, as, as far as the bold color difference, you know, I think that the Libertarian Party is really it, it's. It's the bold color difference that Ronald Reagan was talking about, with the exception of some some social acceptance that you don't see in the conservative party. So I don't, I'm not fully convinced to totally switch over and start voting uh, libertarian, but I do think that some at some point in the near future, we may possibly be a society that could elect a third party. Anyway, 
uh, the clip that I have here from Ronald Reagan, it's him talking about socialized medicine. So I'll go ahead and play it for you right now. Now, back in 1927, an American socialist, Norman Thomas, six times candidate for president on the Socialist Party ticket, said the American people would never vote for socialism. But he said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adopt every fragment of the socialist program. There are many ways in which our government has invaded the precincts of private citizens, the uh, method of earning a living. Our government is in business to the extent of owning more than 19,000 businesses covering 47 different lines of activity. This amounts to a fifth of the total industrial capacity of the United States. But at the moment, I'd like to talk about another way because this threat is with us and at the moment is more imminent. One of the traditional methods of imposing statism or socialism on a people has been by way of medicine. It's very easy to disguise a medical program as a humanitarian project. Most people are a little reluctant to oppose anything that suggests medical care for people who possibly can't afford it. Now, the American people, if you put it to them about socialized medicine and gave them a chance to choose, would unhesitatingly vote against it. We had an example of this under the Truman administration. It was proposed that we have a compulsory health insurance program for all people in the United States, and, of course, the American people unhesitatingly rejected this. So, with the American people on record as not wanting socialized medicine, Congressman Ferrand introduced the Ferrand Bill. This was the idea that all people of Social Security age should be brought under a program of compulsory health insurance. Now, this would not only be our senior citizens, this would be the dependents and those who are disabled, this would be young people if they are dependents of someone eligible for Social Security. Now, Congressman Ferrand brought the program out on that idea of just for that particular group of people. But Congressman Ferrand was subscribing to this foot-in-the-door philosophy because he said, if we can only break through and get our foot inside the door, then we can expand the program after that. Walter Ruther said, it's no secret that the United Automobile Workers is officially on record as backing a program of national health insurance. And by national health insurance, he meant socialized medicine for every American. Well, let's see what the socialists themselves had to say about it. They say, once the Ferran bill is passed, this nation will be provided with a mechanism for socialized medicine capable of indefinite expansion in every direction until it includes the entire population. Well, we can't say we haven't been warned. Now, Congressman Ferrand is no longer a congressman of the United States government. He has been replaced, not in his particular assignment, but in his backing of such a bill by Congressman King of California. It is presented in the idea of a great emergency that millions of our senior citizens are unable to provide needed medical care. But this ignores the fact that in the last decade, 127 million of our citizens, in just 10 years, have come under the protection of some form of privately owned medical or hospital insurance. Now, the advocates of this bill, when you try to oppose it, challenge you on an emotional basis. They say, what would you do? Throw these poor old people out to die with no medical attention? That's ridiculous, and of course, no one has advocated it. As a matter of fact, in the last session of Congress, a bill was adopted known as the Kerr-Mills Bill. Now, without even allowing this bill to be tried, to see if it works, they have introduced this King Bill, which is really the Ferran Bill. What is the Kerr-Mills Bill? It is a frank recognition of the medical need or problem of a senior citizen that I've mentioned. And it is provided from the federal government money to the states and the local communities that can be used at the discretion of the state to help those people who need it. Now, what reason could the other people have for backing a bill which says we insist on compulsory health insurance for senior citizens on a basis of age alone, regardless of whether they are worth millions of dollars, whether they have an income, whether they're protected by their own insurance, whether they have savings? I think we could be excused for believing that, as ex-Congressman Ferran said, this was simply an excuse to bring about what they wanted all the time, socialized medicine. James Madison, in 1788, speaking to the Virginia Convention, said, Since the general civilization of mankind, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachment of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. 
They want to attach this bill to Social Security. And they say, here is a great insurance program, now instituted, now working. Let's take a look at Social Security itself. Again, very few of us disagree with the original premise that there should be some form of saving that would keep destitution from following unemployment by reason of death, disability, or old age. And to this end, Social Security was adopted. But it was never intended to supplant private savings, private insurance, pension programs of unions and industries. Now, in our country, under our free enterprise system, we have seen medicine reach the greatest heights that it has in any country in the world. Today, the relationship between patient and doctor in this country is something to be envied any place. The privacy, the care that is given to a person, the right to choose a doctor, the right to go from one doctor to the other. But let's also look from the other side at the freedom the doctor loses. A doctor would be reluctant to say this. Well, like you, I'm only a patient, so I can say it in his behalf. The doctor begins to lose freedoms. It's like telling a lie, and one leads to another. First, you decide that the doctor can have so many patients. They're equally divided among the various doctors by the government. But then the doctors aren't equally divided geographically. So a doctor decides he wants to practice in one town, and the government has to say to him, you can't live in that town. They already have enough doctors. You have to go someplace else. And from here, it's only a short step to dictating where he will go. This is a freedom that I wonder whether any of us have the right to take from any human being. I know how I'd feel if you, my fellow citizens, decided that to be an actor, I had to become a government employee and work in a national theater. Take it into your own occupation or that of your husband. All of us can see what happens once you establish the precedent that the government can determine a man's working place and his working methods, determine his employment. From here, it's a short step to all the rest of socialism, to determining his pay. And pretty soon, your son won't decide when he's in school where he will go or what he will do for a living. He will wait for the government to tell him where he will go to work and what he will do. In this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in world's history, the only true revolution. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. But here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, a little group of men, the Founding Fathers, for the first time, established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. This freedom was built into our government with safeguards. We talk democracy today, and strangely we let democracy begin to assume the aspect of majority rule is all that is needed. Well, majority rule is a fine aspect of democracy, provided there are guarantees written in to our government concerning the rights of the individual and of the minorities. What can we do about this? Well, you and I can do a great deal. We can write to our congressmen, to our senators. We can say right now that we want no further encroachment on these individual liberties and freedoms. And at the moment, the key issue is we do not want socialized medicine. Now, you may think when I say write to the congressman or the senator that this is like writing fan mail to a television program. It isn't. In Washington today, 40,000 letters, less than 100 per congressman, are evidence of a trend in public thinking. Representative Halleck of Indiana has said, when the American people want something from Congress, regardless of its political complexion, if they make their wants known, Congress does what the people want. So write. It's as simple as finding just the name of your congressman or your senator, and then you address your letter to that individual's name, if he's a congressman, to the House Office Building, Washington, D.C., if he's a senator, to the Senate Office Building, Washington, D.C., and if this man writes back to you and tells you that he, too, is for free enterprise, that we have these great services and so forth that must be performed by government, don't let him get away with it. Show that you have not been convinced. Write a letter right back and tell him that you believe in government economy and fiscal responsibility, that you know that governments don't tax to get the money they need. Governments will always find a need for the money they get. And that you demand the continuation of our traditional free enterprise system. You and I can do this. The only way we can do it is by writing to our congressman, even if we believe that he's on our side to begin with, write to strengthen his hand, give him the ability 
to stand before his colleagues in Congress and say, I have heard from my constituents and this is what they want. Write those letters now, call your friends and tell them to write them. If you don't, this program, I promise you, will pass just as surely as the sun will come up tomorrow. And behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom as we have known it in this country. Until, one day, as Norman Thomas said, we will awake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days, you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Man, Ronald Reagan, if you can't relate that to today, you're just not paying attention. He made an excellent point when he was talking about getting on the move, contacting your senators, contacting your, your congressmen, contact everyone in the political sphere, in the political world, whether or not they're your representative or not, hold them accountable, hold their feet to the fire, you know, push them on the issues, let them know that, you know, what you want, let them know where their constituents stand, you know. Also, if there's somebody that, that you support, let them know. And that that's a problem right there that we see all too often where, a political, political candidate, he doesn't know the will of the people's behind him because we're not letting him know. We're not rallying around that guy. You know, I think that was one thing we did really good when Ted Cruz was uh, <clears throat> was doing his whole uh, <clears throat> defund Obamacare thing. So that was that was really awesome. Everybody did really good. The petition, uh, you know, the petition really showed uh, you know the support of the American people, and I think it led to him actually fighting for that to repeal Obamacare. And defund Obamacare. That that was that was something that was really beneficial, and that's proof to you guys right there that a petition can actually do something. You know, it can influence some kind of change. Maybe you know it'll get ignored, just like this defund Obamacare thing got ignored. But there was a fight, and honestly, the reason why we are in the situation we're in right now is because of these Rhino Republicans, these infiltrator progressives in the Republican Party. That's why it got ignored. That's why we don't see a fight now. That's why nothing happened with that. If we had more Ted Cruz's, more Rand Paul's, more conservatives that will hold to conservative values and fight for us, we would be in a much better situation. I'm sure we'd see a situation where the, the debt ceiling would actually you know, get, uh, get uh, stopped to where they, they're not just spending and spending and spending. Because as Ronald Reagan says, the government doesn't get money to pay for what they need. They find ways to spend the money that they have, and they'll continue to try to get more. It's not just about paying our debts. It's about expanding the government. Why is it so difficult to understand the fact that, it's, that we need to balance our budget? They expect me and you to balance our budget, but they're not held accountable. Congress isn't the ones that are held accountable. It's simple freaking math. If you're earning such and such amount, you can't exceed such and such amount. It, it's math. And we are, we are piling on the debt, piling it on. We're creating a world that our kids, they're not going to see the same world that you and I grew up in. You're not going to see the same civilization anymore. We're, we're going to move towards socialist policies, and if we don't do that, it doesn't matter. We're going to be crippled by debt anyway. Our kids are being turned into slaves. Anyway, that's the show for today, guys. If you if you liked it, I, I'd appreciate it if you uh, if you would uh, give me an email, send me an email at talkingonthemoveshow.com. Let me know what you think. Uh, next show you can tune in. Uh, you can give us a call uh, also at 619-924-0986. Uh, I want to thank you guys uh, for tuning in, our listeners. I really appreciate you guys for tuning in week after week. You know, we appreciate your continued support. Don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com and uh, fill out that uh, that uh, quick poll down at the bottom right of it asking if uh, you think it's time for a new party. You can check us out here at blogtalkradio.com uh, forward slash on the move show, facebook.com forward slash on the move show, youtube.com forward slash on the move show, twitter.com forward slash on the move show. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, and get on the move.